I think you'll find interesting a whole, a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, we all go? All right, bah, bah, bah. here we go. Now, where we have reached between last week and, and this is the fact that we have attempted to show you a descriptive uh, documentation that the word Jesus, which is a Greek word and bears the numerical value of 888, which is the sun, the word Jesus means the sun, which is a star. We have gone through the entire uh, litany here. We've gone through the entire litany of, of why we've reached this conclusion. And you can see it on this sheet, which is evidence of Jesus as the sun. It then describes the sun. And on page two, describes Pegasus, Virgo, and Ursa Major, where these sun stars have been discovered. Okay? Okay. Now, what makes this important is if you go outside when it's a clear day and you look up in the sky, you'll see the sun. And you are on a planet that is circling around the sun. That is the first sun star. If our proposition is correct that we've made in these papers, the word Jesus reflects that sun. So that's the first coming of the sun. Now, here the scientists in Switzerland and elsewhere have made a discovery of the second sun star. This is the second coming of Jesus. And it said in the Bible it was going to be on a white horse. And the second coming is in Pegasus. So here then the prophecy has been fulfilled. The second coming, the sign of the power of the second coming shows up in Pegasus at the sign of the white horse, which happened a couple of three months ago. Then they found the third one. And after finding that the sign, the power has returned, the third one shows up in Virgo, which is the sign of the virgin, just as the first one did. And the, the second one, the third one shows up in Ursa Major. In Ursa Major, which shows up in the Big Dipper. The seven brightest stars in Ursa Major are the Big Dipper. In the Big Dipper, there are two stars that point, and they are called the pointers. They point to the Little Dipper, which is Ursa Minor. And Ursa Minor contains what is called the Pole Star, or the North Star, which is the navigational star. What makes this important is because of the fact that in the mythology of Ursa Major, we have Artemis, who is seduced by Zeus, and she has a child, and the child's name is Arcus. After Zeus seduced Artemis, and she had a child, Arcus, he cast them into the sky, and she became Ursa Major, and her child, her son, became Ursa Minor. This is why it's important when we think of this star, the third star that's been shown. The first one is in Pegasus, that means the power has returned. The second one is in Virgo, born of a virgin, which means it's born of virgin consciousness as it is within you in your meditation. And the third one shows up in Ursa Major. Ursa Major is the mother pointing to her son, saying, follow my son. In Ursa Minor, the North Star, which is the navigational star which people have followed to find direction for thousands, thousands, and thousands of years, the North Star, the Pole Star, is named Arcus. It is the child. And so here, then, you see the fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah, which says, and a child shall lead them. Now, interestingly enough, for 12,000 years, the North Star was Draco, the dragon. And so then, the child overcame the dragon. The dragon was cast out, as it says in the Bible, and all these it, it types of mythological things that are in Revelation. The, the dragon is cast out and replaced by the child. And so here's the important thing that we're seeing. What I'm showing you now is not to be read in the Bible, it's not to be found in a church, there's not a priest or a minister or a rabbi has the vaguest idea that this stuff is even going on. These people are out of this thing, they have nothing to do with it. What I'm showing you now is being revealed to you by astronomers. And what you saw 2,000 years ago when you had of Jesus, the first sun star being discovered in this Christmas story, that was revealed by astronomers. They were called the Magi from the tribe of Magi, which is the root of the word magician from the tribes of Magi from Iran. So here the second star, the second sun, the second coming of Jesus is being fulfilled on the white horse which was discovered three months ago, in Virgo the virgin which was discovered about a month ago, and in Ursa Major the mother pointing to her son saying, follow my son. And so that's where we've come to. Uh, there's two 
right up here in the third row. Right up in the third row there's two. So that's where we've come to. The second thing that we discovered, which was important and in and, and, and which we brought to you, was the fact that in order for you to be a part of all of this, you have to have built within you a connective force that harmonizes with the universe. There are 12 zodiacal signs. There are 12 constellations in the ecliptic. There are 12 months in the year. There are 12 disciples. There are 12 tribes of Israel. There's 12, 12, 12, 12, 12. And we found 12, and there's a connection in everything. If there's a connection of the 12 signs of the zodiac in the universe and the 12 months on the earth, then what about you? And we found out by looking in Stedman's dictionary and so forth that you have 12 pairs of cranial nerves throwing through 12 apertures in your brain, which are the 12 gates of the city. In addition to that, we found out that Moses was given a detailed pattern of constructing the tabernacle. And they said to Moses, Moses, make sure you make this exactly because there's something else like it someplace else. And we didn't know where. And Moses was to construct an outer court, and in the very holy place was to the right, which was called the Holy of Holies, and separating the two was a veil. And no one could go in the veil, through the veil, but the high priest. And what we found in Stedman's Medical Dictionary, in Graves' Book of Anatomy, is that in your brain, there is an outer covering called dura mater, which is the hard mother, the hard covering. Inside of your brain, deep in the most inner recess of it, is a beautiful thing called pia mater, the tender mother, the holy mother, the holy spirit. And separating the outer from the inner is what called arachnoid, which is the web. And that's an interesting thing. So here then basically we found that the construction of the tabernacle in the desert was patterned after what is constructed in your brain. This is something that was written five, six thousand years ago, which was anatomically correct. There is an outer covering, which is dura. There is a web which separates that from the whole. And there is pia mater, which is the holy, which is the holiest place deep within you. Anatomically correct. Who wrote this thing? Who knew the construction of the human brain 6,000 years ago? And yet, it's in this book. So this is interesting. And so we've connected the fact that there are 12 in the universe, there are 12 in you. We've connected the fact that the construction of the tabernacle is actually an anatomical description of your brain. And we didn't document it with any priest or, or John Hagee or any of these crazy people. We documented it with scientists and astronomers and so forth. Now, let's look at, once again, why the importance and, and what we're talking about is Jesus as the sun star. <laughs> when you have the planet Earth that you live on, right now, when you start October, November, December, January, the days start to get short, and you sink into the darkness and the cold of the season. Somebody has to take you out of the darkness and the cold and restore you to warmth, restore you to new life, bring back the color, bring back the spring, bring, bring back the summer, bring back the point where you can get outside and be free. And the sun does that. And how does the sun do that? The sun does it by coming down here and giving itself, by sacrificing itself. On December the 21st, the sun enters a constellation called the Cross, the Southern Cross. After it goes through the cross, it sits in the winter solstice three days and three nights, and then on December the 25th, it resurrects out of the winter solstice, and every day after that starts to get a little longer. Every day after that starts to get a little brighter. Every day after that starts to bring us closer to the springtime. The sun does that. The sun, in order for you to get out of the cold of the winter, the sun must go on the cross, don't you understand? Your days, do you notice that every day now it gets a little bit brighter? Do you know that at 5 o'clock now it's a little brighter than it was a couple of months ago? Why? Because the sun has come and restored light to the world. The sun has taken us out of the coldness of the winter time and is restoring us back to the lightness and will give us back to the spring. But in order for that to happen, the sun must go through the cross. Now, here, let's go to the story. How is this allegorically portrayed in the Bible? Here you have a place called Jerusalem. And you have a Jesus who is the sun. And Jesus comes down to the earth. And he comes down to the earth to set the world free from darkness. And what is the darkness in the earth? The darkness of the earth when he came was not February or January or December or November. When he came, the darkness of the world was known as religion. Religion. And he had to set the world free from religion. 
He had to rescue the world out of the darkness and the cold of religion, set the world, and bring light back to the world. And what did he do? He came down to the earth, and he went through the cross, and he sat three days and three nights in the tomb, and then he resurrected, and then he rose, and he brought light back to the world. And that's what the whole story is about. That's why this is so important. Because what you're reading about, what you're talking about, is described as the sun stars. The, as it says in the Bible, let the stars be for signs. You see, there's only one thing that is away from the earth and not influenced by people and their crazy ideas which have brought so much horror and pain and violence to the world. The only thing left, or the only thing there ever was, are the stars. Nobody can change them. Nobody can touch them. Nobody can do anything with them. And look at what it says in, when you try to learn about a Jesus, you try to learn about a God or whatever. Turn to page 919, let me show you something. On page 919 in the Bible, it's Romans chapter 1. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, the Apostle Paul makes a statement. He says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so there is no excuse. You can look and you can see this. How can you sit here? How can you not go outside and look? You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to send you home with this so that you. But do you know what this is? This is a picture of the second coming of Jesus Christ. These people are sitting in churches praying that it's going to happen. All they got to do is go outside with a pair of binoculars and look up, and there it is. If you accept the premise that this is the sun star, and there is no other premise that you can accept because his life and everything about him duplicates the sun in the sky. Now the point is, will you, will you listen? The point is, are, are people prepared to understand you live on a planet? You live on one of these planets going through all this chaos in the universe. There are black holes going boom. There's zing, stuff whizzing by, things exploding, all gaseous things creating atomic energy, boom, boom, boom. And you're on a planet floating right through the middle of this thing. And most of your religious people say, we don't believe it. <laughs> we don't believe in any of that. Ah, my pastor says, don't get involved. How can you not get involved? You're like a flea on a tennis ball, boom, <laughs> going through it. I'm not going to get involved in that. I'm not going to pay any attention to it. It's just like saying, I don't believe in February. Well, you may not believe in February, but some unbelievable thing dumped two feet of snow in my driveway. <laughs> so it doesn't make any difference whether you believe it or not. There's one right up here, Joe. It doesn't make any difference whether you believe in it or not. It's here. And so let me, let me, let me show you the words that they gave Jesus to say. And remember something. Jesus is the product of Greek mythology. The Bible that you're holding in your hand is written in Greece by Greeks 2,000 years ago, and it is filled with Plato, it is filled with Pythagoras, it is filled with Aristotle, it is Greek myth, and even the word Jesus as a Greek name to describe the Son. And what do they give Jesus to do? How many of you ever heard the, the, the expression, red sky at night, sailor's delight, red sky in morning, sailor be warning, huh? Okay. You know that, right? And you know, you can look, or you can see the signs. You can see the signs when somebody's getting ready to freak out, you know, flip out, say, hey, hey, that's a bad sign. Or when somebody's in the hospital, and the doctor says, well, there's blood pressure, and say, hey, that's a good sign. Or you look up, and you, and you say, boy, you know, I can feel, I can sense there's going to be a storm. You can tell the signs, right? Watch this. Go to page uh, 793. Page 793. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. I guess we, get, we did the synopsis. The synop you know, there's so much stuff going on, I can't even keep up. You know what I said the other day? I said, the God. I mean, all this stuff is coming in. And Joni Schultz is on the phone, and she's showing me stuff, and then I'm finding stuff. I said, I can't believe this. I, said, I looked at her, and I said, enough already. Stop. I don't want to hear. I don't, don't even mention that. I don't want to hear nothing. And I, you know, it was still coming. I just walked out the door. I sat in front of the television and watched some <laughs> crazy thing. Because it's coming from all over the place. And I mean, it's exciting stuff, but it's hard sometimes to keep up with it because it's coming so hot and heavy. And, and before you walk out the door, you, I mean, you'll know what I'm talking about. And I'll show you these things. But look what it says here in Matthew chapter 16. This is Jesus talking, okay? He says to them, when it's evening, you say, it's going to be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, you say, it's going to be foul weather for the sky is red and lowering. You hypocrite, you can discern the face of the sky. 
but you can't discern the signs of the times. And that's what's going on. That's what's going on. And that's what you, you see, that's why you're sitting here. What I'm saying to you, the astronomers, the magi who came from Persia to a place called Bethlehem in this myth that occurred 2,000 years, have, have come again. They've come again. And what have they said? And the, they said, we followed his star. And you know what you're going to see? When I said, this is the second coming. Hey, what? Huh. I said, this is the second coming of Jesus. It's the second coming of the sun star. It's the third coming of the sun. I said, exactly, exactly. I said, hey, you know what, you, what I'm going to give you right now? You know what it says? The yellow white color of the sun, Pegasus star 51 in Pegasus. And look what it says, which is in fact almost a twin to the sun that's in the sky. Astronomers said that. They said, but you know why astronomers have to say that? Because religious people have no clue that it's even happening. <laughs> This is an astronomy magazine. Listen to this. A star, a planet orbiting a star, a star with nearly the same size, mass, and temperature as the sun. Okay? Uh, and do we have a seat? Is there a chair? Right here, right here. We have a chair over here. You see, something must be catching on here. Something's happening. Uh, something's going on. Good, because you're showing up. So I don't know what the heck this is all about. Why are you coming here? Before I started all this stuff, I had a, a room full just like this. Remember? We had a church. It was a fundamentalist church. You remember? Sean, AJ, and Dot, and Sarah. And then I started talking about this stuff. <sighs> Boy, they all got... <laughs> How long has it taken for you to come back? And you're not even this... Oh, maybe you're... I don't know. <laughs> Anyhow, this thing here says the same size and mass as the sun. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to share this with you. Because what we've, what we've done so far in our study is we, we found and we've accomplished this, that Jesus is the sun. Now, please, I am not saying that Jesus is the sun in the sky. Again, as I said in this piece of paper here, what I'm trying to convey to you is Jesus is demonstrated physically by the sun. Jesus is an entity of power, of love, of healing, of newness, of forgiveness, of wonder that is in everyone. But now... When this power is to return, so that it now can control and start to permeate the earth, it says, look to the white horse. And then just two months ago, it came for the first time in the history of the world. There's a star. It says, behold, the heavens opened up, and I saw a white horse. And the astronomers in, in, in Switzerland said, there it is. A star has come back in the white horse. And just to fulfill it for you, and to prove where this is coming from, the second one is in the Virgin, and the third one is in Ursa Major. And you know what else in Ursa Major? Well, you know why it's so important? Because you identify it with Jesus when it's in Ursa Major. How do you do that? There's a star in the tail of Ursa Major, which is called in Arabic, the daughter of the assembly. Well, there's a star in the right front pole called Talitha. And in Mark 5.22, there's a guy who's the leader of the synagogue, which is the assembly, and he comes up to Jesus and he says, my daughter is dying. And Jesus goes over to his house and stands over the guy's little daughter and he says to her, Talitha, rise. The daughter of the assembly in the tale of Ursa Major and then Talitha, rise. And then, of course, with the child being in Ursa Major, so much. So we've discovered and we've established the fact Jesus is the sun star. This is absolutely fantastic because now we realize there is an intelligence up there. There is a, there is, there is a, there is, there is a wisdom, there is a law, there is a communion with nature, there is something that is moving now to change things on this planet, to change the way you think. That's why you're sitting here. Can you imagine you sitting listening to something like me a couple of years ago? <laughs> you weren't, you were in some church singing, what a wretch you are. Amazing grace, what a wretch am I. And then you were giving a guy money, you say, this is wonderful, I'm a wretch. <laughs> well, here now, look where you are now. You, 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 half of you wouldn't even tell your family where you're going this morning. <laughs> I know that. That's okay. <laughs> okay, so Jesus is in the sun. Where were you? Oh, yes, yes, yes. You have some t-shirts made. You've come a long way, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, maybe we'll do that. Or guess where I was this morning. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Jesus is the sun. We've established that. 
the sun is to return in Pegasus, and we've established that that has occurred. Now, the second thing which we also established, interestingly, was that in Revelation 19, 14, it says, in the armies in heaven, which followed him upon white horses, and then I gave you a copy of the a thing from the astronomers showing you that there are thousands of stars that are hovering around this area like bees swarming on a hive heading towards the earth, and that is the thousands in, on white horses. So we establish these things. God speaks in signs, stars are signs, and the white horse in heaven is a sign as these armies are stars. Now, what I'm going to do for you, and I do to you, I don't know if I've got enough, and if I don't, well, you know, if you're with somebody, just take one. But I'm going to provide this to you, and I'm going to ask you not to read it page by page, but follow along with me, because there are things I want to share with you that are very exciting and very interesting as we go along and build this case for this second coming and, 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 and for this era of Pegasus and Aquarius. Uh, so just if you'll hold them, and, but what you can see in the very first page is for the first time in your life, you will actually see the second coming of Christ. You will actually see the second coming of the sun star right in the white horse where it was prophesied to be. And there's a picture of it right here and you can see it. So uh, if the, yes, that would be great. Would you want to? Okay. Only thing is do it fast. Come on, Alpha, hurry up. Uh, hurry up. Come on, yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. Well, as they're doing that, as they're doing that, I want to cast aside something from you that you have been infected with by religion. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, tell Bill and Joni to bring a couple of blue chairs in with them. All right, you all set? Hey, Bill, get a couple of blue chairs from the, uh, the room there. Uh, we all set? Okay. What I want you to do, for, now do you see this? Do you see it with your own eyes? The planet of 51 Pegasi is the second coming. That's the planet which has fulfilled the prophecy that heaven's open and I saw a white horse. That's the planet right there. And notice if you look at the description under the picture, it displays the white, yellow white color of the sun, which is in fact almost its twin. It is its twin, and it's definitely that which is the second coming. Okay, so now what I wanted to show you, first of all, is in order for you, Joni, come in and bring it right up here. It wasn't bring them both right up here. Bring it, bring it, he's gotten a chair. There's a chair right next to Joan, and then uh, you can bring, uh, he can bring the other one in. All right, the one thing that you've got to get in your head, and it's important for you to get in your mind, is to separate yourself from religion. Religion has no part of this. Religion cannot be involved in this. This is between you and God. And the reason religion can have no part in this is because there are decisions that you're going to have to make in your life that you're going to be instructed by the power that's radiating down from the universe that's going to touch you. And religion is only going to scare you. And let me show you what I'm talking about. Turn on page 631. And in page 631, I want you to look at the book of uh, Jeremiah, and in Jeremiah chapter 10, all right, Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 2, and look what it says, it says the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. What has that just said to you? Who's dismayed at the signs in heaven? Religious people. And who calls them heathens? The Bible. Why? Because they've constructed for themselves false gods and created stories to scare the hell out of you and to keep you trapped and controlled and given the bucks and they have an, an idea about the harmony so that when this thing happens, if one of the greatest things that you hear them say in all of their Christian meetings is look up for your redemption draweth mine. But they won't look up because they're scared to look up. Because what's up there? Stars and signs and the zodiac and Capricorn and Aquarius and all of these things which they say, we're not allowed to look at that. It's like having a car and saying, I'm not allowed to touch the steering wheel because my pastor said don't touch it. So you're going to crash all over the place. <laughs> okay. Now, where does the fear come from? 
Where does the fear come? Who, why, why have you been filled with fear and guilt and all of this stuff all of your life? Why have you felt this way all of your life? Go to page 597, and at page 597 in the book of Isaiah, I would show you something. It's in Isaiah chapter 29. And in Isaiah chapter 29, it says in verse 13, These people draw near me with their mouth. With their lips they honor me, but they have removed their heart from me. And now watch this last line, and I want you to stick it up on your refrigerator. Their fear toward me is taught by the precepts of men. That's where it comes from. They told you all of this stuff, and they told you to be afraid of all of these things, and they told you to be frightened by all of these things. And not only are you frightened of the stars, you wind up being frightened by yourself. See? There are signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. Now let me show you something. Go to, now we're talking about this time where you are, right here. I, you know, you're not going to hear from me any more stuff about, you've got to have faith in this, you should believe in this, you can read it. Throw all the books, get all the New Age books and all these, throw all the stuff away, forget about it, don't listen to it, don't read about it, because you don't have to anymore. It's all over, it's time now to look up. When you see a little ship with a green blinking lights landing in your backyard, you'll say, well, oh, here we go. <laughs> the guy gets out with the Bible and says, thus saith the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> thus saith the Lord, yeah, here I am. Or a little white horse. Okay, anyhow, page 846, the book of Luke. That'd be great, you know, some guy goes out and gets a pot on and comes home and, Jennifer, is a white horse in the backyard. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> All right, now, this is it. This is what we're going to look at. This is what we're going to look at. Luke chapter 11. You there? Look at verse 30. For as Jonah was assigned unto the Ninevites, so shall the Son of Man be to this generation. So, according to the myth, the sign was Jonah. Why was Jonah the sign? Because the guy lived in a fish for three days and three nights. That's disgusting and it's ridiculous. <laughs> you do know that it's disgusting. Because this guy would have to live in the fish's intestines. Do you know what goes on in there? For three days, you want to live in somebody's intestines for three days? Just think of that. Oh my God. Well, I can't wait till I get out of here. <laughs> so, what is it talking about? It means that when you are on the ship, which is yourself and your life, you must be cast overboard into the sea, which is God's truth, where you will be swallowed by the fish. Not bad. Where you will be swallowed by the fish, which is God. Okay, that's what that myth is about. You're in the fish three days and three nights. Jesus is in the tomb three days and three nights. The number three means new life. Why? Because on December 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, it's the winter solstice. The sun is in bowels in the bowels of the earth for three days and three nights. And on December the 25th, by the trajectory of the earth, it is born again. That's why number three is important. That's why Jesus is in the tomb three days. That's why Noah was in the, uh, Jonah was in the fish three days because the sun is in the bowels of the earth three days and three nights. There's a chair right there. Yeah, right there, and there's one over here. Okay. Uh, now, this is what I was saying. What does it say there? It says, as Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, the Son of Man shall be to this generation. Son of Man. Okay? Now, you are in the Aquarian Age. The ruling planet of the Aquarian Age is Uranus. Right? I gave you these. You have this? Okay. What I want you to do, I want you to go back to the third page where I blew up out of uh, a page out of the dictionary. All right? Okay. Luke 11.30 says, the only sign shall be the Son of Man to this generation. Do you see Uranus? Do you see the big letters Uranus? Do you see what it is in Greek mythology? 
It is the son of and husband of the earth. It is the son of the earth. It is the son of man. And the Bible says that the sign that you should look for is the son of man, which will be the sign to this generation. The son of man is Aquarius, is Uranus, and Uranus is the ruling planet in the age. As you're sitting here right this minute, the son of man is spinning in the universe and creating all of the turmoil that it's doing in your life and in the weather and all over the place. All right? It's the son of man. Now, okay. What I also want you to do is open to page 779. Look at page 779. Jesus has got something else to say in Matthew chapter 4. Page 779. In Matthew chapter 4, you there? Look at verse 17. Look at verse 17. You there? Now remember something. What you're looking at, you're looking at an English translation of the Greek. That's Greek you're looking at, which was translated into English. In Matthew 4, verse 17, Jesus says, Repent. Change your ways. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do you have this in your thing? You have this in? Look down here. You see what it says in Greek? Uranus, 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 Uranus. What does it say? What's it mean? Heaven. 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 What is Jesus saying in the Greek in the Bible? Change. Change. Why? For the kingdom of Uranus is at hand. I don't mean maybe. I mean if you pick up a Greek Bible and you look at the Greek words, it says the kingdom of Uranus is at hand. And it is. And the reason you have Pegasus and the reason you have Aquarius and the reason you have all of these things is because Uranus has returned to claim his bride, Gaia. All right? Now, I mean, if I said this to you, but it's so much more when you see it yourself that Uranus is at hand. Now, all of you have been coming here for a long time. I've told you the number seven means divine intervention. There are seven chakras and so forth and so on. They knew of the seven planets at that time. The number seven means divine intervention. Turn to the last page. Look at the word Pegasus at the very top. What does it say? In astronomy, a constellation of the northern hemisphere near Cygnus represented as the winged horse of mythology. It is the... Seventh largest constellation in the sky. You see that? Right here. I gave you this. I said, well, I wanted to see if you were paying attention. Next to the last page. <laughs> Next to the last page. Do you have it now? Do you see on the top where it says Pegasus? It is the seventh largest constellation in the sky. Look at the next one down. Uranus. What is it? What is it? They just found the third sun star in the Big Dipper. Look at the next one down. American name for the? Seven. 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 I mean, do you get a hint that somebody's trying to tell you something? I should hope that you would get a hint that somebody's trying to tell you something. And if you look down at the very next, you'll see Uranus, the Greek form of Uranus, meaning heaven. And Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's saying the kingdom of Uranus is at hand. And in uh, Urania, which is the muse of astronomy in Greek mythology, one of the nine daughters of Zeus, there are nine daughters, and notice the last one, Urania, is astronomy. All right? So then we start, I hope, to get you to understand. The ancients would tell you that when Uranus takes over, and when Uranus starts to exert itself in the universe, what's going to happen? The storms are going to be wild. The storms are going to be a hundred times worse than they ever were. Have you noticed anything? Oh, yeah. But I'll tell you something. Not only does Uranus affect storms outside, it affects storms. Have you noticed anything? I was listening to the radio the other day, and a guy says, well, geez, I don't know what's going on. He says, a few years ago, I used to be able to go out of my house and leave the door unlocked. No more! Do you notice anything? There's a change. There's a wild change. There's a wild change in the weather. There's a wild change in the way you think. There's a wild change in all that. And what is this? It's because people don't understand this and they're not harmonizing with it. I told you, there are 12 up here and there are 12 in your brain. That means that you have a plug that has 12 prongs in it to fit into the outlet that has 12 holes in it. But you haven't connected the plug to the outlet. And so you're not in touch. And so all of this stuff is raising hell inside of your head as well as raising raising hell all over the universe. Bang! And people say, what's going on? Well, I don't know what this is. 
And now they got the religious right trying to correct it by saying gays can't get married. Who cares? Or you've got people sitting in Washington in blue suits getting up and celebrating because they've just taken away money from old people and people are just laying in the street somewhere. It's wonderful oh, what we've accomplished. So, lunacy goes on all over the place. And now you have Yasser Arafat. Guy used to pack a pistol and blow your head off for a nickel. Now he's kissing everybody. <laughs> what, what happened to this guy? What happened to him? What's, what is this all about? What happened? Why are you? Why are you like this? Stop kissing me. What? 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 Yes. Well, whatever he makes it. Maybe Lewis will be uh, who wear a dress in a few weeks. Who knows? Everything is crazy. I don't know anything about that. But the point is this. Do you know that the world is in an upheaval? Do you know that you're in an upheaval? And do you know that things are in change? And it's, I'm telling you, why is it Uranus? Because Uranus spins in the opposite direction of all the other planets. Uranus was once married to Gaia, your mother, Mother Earth. And they got together very nice, and they had children. And one of the children turned out to be a little snot nose named Saturn. <laughs> well, Saturn, <laughs> Saturn turned around, got to be an old and Saturn had a dual nature named Kronos. You see Kronos every New Year's Eve, you know, he's got the lantern and the sickle. So Kronos was sharpening up his sickle, and the old man come home one night, and <coughs> Kronos let him have it and castrated his father. Well, of course, that would, that would have an effect on a marriage, you know, the bobbit thing? <laughs> Uranus boogied out. He says, the, the heck, this kid's crazy. I'm getting out of this house, uh, guy. You, you, you got it yourself. So takes off, and Saturn then rules the ages, and we have all the conflicts and the wars and all of the stuff that's going on. And after that, after a time, Venus, which is love, with the aid of the Cyclops, which is a single eye, rose out of the ocean, which is God's deepest truth, and cast Saturn out of heaven and restored Uranus back. And so now Uranus is coming back hobbling a little bit, a little bit sore, but anyhow, coming back <laughs> to reclaim his bride. And where is the wedding going to take place? It's taking place in Aquarius, where the man changed the water to wine. Man changed. Now, <clears throat> this, and, and this is happening. So, yes? But Uranus has a chunk out of it. Yeah, well, Uranus has a chunk out of it. Albert told us that. <laughs> and of course, that would be, if you know the story of what happened there with Uranus and this. Okay. But so this is what's going on. Now, why don't we tell you something? Let me ask, let me ask you a question. How many of you knew this? Okay, we had two people. Hey, all your people said, hey, anyway. Why didn't you know? It's because nobody paid attention. You're like, you're running around in this tennis ball. I've got to go to the shop, right? Why do you have to go to the shop, right? I can't go to meditation. What will the couch do without me? And all of this stuff going on. And so you, nobody has the slightest idea. And this is happening, and it's impacting on your life, and it's impacting on your kids, and it's impacting on the world, and it's impacting on violence, and, it's, and nobody's paying any attention. And why aren't you paying any attention? Because your church said not to. Yes. So we're just beginning all this. Yeah, and, and even that is, is up in the air. I mean, but it's, it's the way the scientists have projected the fact that they're in Aquarius is by, is by the changes that are taking place. And, and that's very true. So what you have to then do is start to plug in and start to pay attention. For God's sake, let me ask you a question. You're all sitting here and you're staring at me. Let me ask you a question. If it said, I mean, and what if they said in the Bible, well, and then all of a sudden, as the astronomers watched, there in the sign of Pegasus, a star appeared. And so the astronomer said, we have followed his star. Who is it? Oh, it's Jesus. And so, oh, well, you, would, you know what you would do? You would go to church. I'm going to go to church because I believe that. That's my religion. But here it's happened. It's happened right over your head. It's happening right on CNN. I don't have any attention to it. The astronomer said, we have seen his star. It's the same. And they said, we don't know what's going on. We're so excited about it. That's why it's so important. And so then God says, well, okay, maybe they, maybe they will get excited about that. Because you know, Pegasus, they don't know. They're not into all that Greek stuff. I know what I'll do with the second one. Where are you going to put the second one? Let's put it in the virgin. Wow, that'll get them. <laughs> you know what? You didn't even know what happened. Did you? Well, if you came here, you knew. But otherwise, you hadn't the slightest idea. And then, what about... The little child shall lead him. So we'll put this one in Ursa Major and have the mother pointing to the child and saying, follow my son. That's going to be great. That'll really get him. What do you think, Jesus? Oh, yeah, because I ain't going back there, you know. Because <laughs> <laughs> those people are <laughs> Okay, so, so the third one comes and they say, and the 
follow my son. And the child, Arcus, is the North Star. <laughs> the child has been leading everybody for thousands of years. Every sailor, every captain looked up. They got their bearings on the North Star. They're following the child, don't you see? And all of this stuff is where? It's in you. The kingdom is in you. Where is the sun star? Remember I told you the sun star? It has to come through the cross so that winter can go away and that Jesus had to go through the cross so the religion would go away. Well, what about inside of you? You've got the 12 here, but you know what you've got here other than the little pouch? You've got solar plexus. It's the place of the sun. And the sun inside of you is crucified when you separate from the thought and you take the five wounds of sight, taste, taste, touch, smell, and hearing. And then the sun inside of you rises up to the pineal gland and it opens the pineal gland. And guess what comes out of the pineal gland? Melatonin. You don't have to go down to the store and get cow's melatonin anymore. You can use your own. You can use your own. It flows in your body. It opens the right hemisphere of the brain. And summertime comes to your life. The spring of your life is renewed. And all of this stuff, because this was written in the stars long before it was ever written in a, in a Bible. Remember I told you, in your brain, this is your brain, you have the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. And remember what we talked about? Outside is Dura Mater, which is the hard mother. And inside is Pia Mater, which is the Holy Spirit. This is the gentle mother, separated by the web. You know what the web? That web is called arachnoid, the web, the membrane. There was a girl by the name of Arachnid. And Arachnid looked at Athena and said, I am the greatest weaver in the world. And she said, I'm going to challenge you to a weaving contest. And Athena said, yeah, you're crazy. Nobody can outweave me. She said, yeah, I can outweave you. So they started weaving. And Arachnid made this magnificent tapestry of the gods in a very compromising position. And Athena got ticked off big time. And Athena looked at her and screamed at her and said, look what you've done, you filthy mind. And it got little Arachnid so upset that she committed suicide. And Athena looked at her dead body and went over and touched her dead body and Arachnid became a scorpion spider and she weaved a web. And she has weaved webs ever since. And the web that is in your brain that separates Dura Mater from Pia Mater is called Arachnid. Where does this stuff come from? And it's there. And so then what happens? You've got Dura, you've got Pia, you've got Arachnid, the spider spinning her web in your brain, and then what happens? Somebody comes and writes a Bible. There is something that exists that is hard outside, that is gentle and holy inside, and is separated by a veil and a web. We're going to build this, we call it the tabernacle, and see if they find out what it is. And you know what it is. And you know what? You're the only people sitting in a group on this Sunday morning that has the foggiest idea what it is. I can guarantee you. You can go and be the Pope. Guess what I know? And you will tell these people the truth and they will run you out. But you take in that Gray's Anatomy or Stedman and say, here it is. Say, this, is what, this is what you're going to be asked to do. Anyhow, in that brain, remember I told you? There is a hidden, closed place. The ancients knew what it was. And this hidden closed place is a place where from which is secreted the oils that go into your body to give you life. And the name of that place is called Claustrum. It's in the brain. You find this in the medical book. And all of life comes from the brain and all of the oils of life. And the ancients knew it was the closed place. It's the root of the word claustrophobia, being afraid of closed place. It is the closed place. And the ancients said, it is the holy claustrum. And the gifts of life come down from the brain. And it changed, and it became the holy claustrum, the holy clause. It became the saint claustrum, the saint clause. And you know it now as Santa Claus, bringing gifts from the North Pole. But you see him as a fat guy bringing Nintendos. But have we screwed this up or what? Do we know? <laughs> Why do I want to tell you that? What's, what's that important? You've heard that before. Why is that important now? Because of you. Joni was on the phone with me. This is a something that's gotten into me to consider Gemini. I said, what are you telling me, Gemini? I got stuff all over the place. People's Uranus and up the road, all this stuff. I don't know what Gemini. What are you telling me this now? What am I going to do? 
And then I looked down in my book, and I said, the next thing we're going to talk about is in page 918. And on page 918, it's in the book of Acts, and it's an interesting thing that this Apostle Paul said, and it's another sign that the Bible sticks in. Remember, all this stuff is symbolic for you to look at. All right? You there? Okay. Acts 28, and look at verse 11. And after three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor Pollux. Castor Pollux of the twins? The twins. Gemini. Gemini. That great? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Used to be known, and were known also by the Greeks as, or over the Egyptians, for somebody by Hercules and Apollo. But that's, that's only part. Do you have this thing I gave you? Open it to the last page. Before you do, let's look at me. Before you do, let me tell you about There's something called Dendera Zodiac, which is the most ancient name. Dendera Zodiac predates Egyptian, predates Greek. Dendera Zodiac is the most ancient. Okay, you got that? Sign Gemini, Messiah's reign is Prince of Peace. All the pictures of the sign are confused. The Greeks, Apollo and Hercules, Castor and Pollux, the name of the vessel in which Paul sailed. You see that? All right, next phrase, next paragraph. The name in the ancient Dendera Zodiac is Clausus or? And what does it mean? The place of him who comes. <laughs> now that should have shot a little something right up your back. Huh? What is it called? It's called, you've got a claustrum in your brain. It is the closed place. And you've got a pia mater in your brain. And she is sequestered behind the web and the spider. And you've got to get through there. And you do that by meditating and separating from the thoughts of the mind. But here is the holy cross to, portrayed by the ancients in the sign of the zodiac, Gemini. And it means the place of him who comes. And so Revelation guides us to look for a heavenly sign, a star, a means of communication, the white horse. And there's a heaven inside of you, as Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is within you. There is a heaven without, and you've seen it. You see all of this. Do you know something? You look at all of these stars that I'm telling you about, and here is the thing. Everywhere in Christianity and religious circles and in Muslims and all of these things, the book. It's either the Koran or it's the Bible. The book! The Word of God. The Holy Word of God. You know, I got a Word of God. And everybody's got a Word of God. And there's a thousand different versions of them because they're all changed. But you know what? There's a Word of God that isn't changed. And this Word of God was copied from that Word of God. In other words, the information that's in this book. The reason that Jesus is revealed by astronomers, the reason that he's born in a manger and all of this stuff, the reason that you saw about the white horse is because this book was copied from the book that's written in the sky. Now, how do I know that this book is written? Let's go to page 459. And in page 459, you'll see the oldest book ever written in the history of mankind, page 459. And in Job chapter 38, I just want to show you something. There's no older book written in the world than this book. This book is, Job is about 6,000 years. Nobody even knows. It's an oriental drama. But you're on page 38. Now, it doesn't make any sense to you that they could write about something in this book if it didn't exist already. They would have to write about something that already existed. If you're going to make a comment in a book, you're commenting on something that exists before you sit down to write it. And look what it says in Job chapter 38 and in verse 31. Can you bind the sweet influence of the Pleiades? The Pleiades. The Pleiades are still there, folks. You can see the Pleiades. You can look up and see the Pleiades. And there's the Pleiades was named before the book of Job was written. See? I don't know. Can you loose the bands of Orion? Yeah, the, the gate of God is Orion. It was there long before there was ever any good thing as a Bible. And look at that next word, Maseroth. Can you bring forth Maseroth? You know what the word Maseroth means? The 12 signs of the zodiac. 
You can find it in any dictionary. The 12 signs of the zodiac. Can you guide Arcturus? With, he is the brightest star in the knee of the constellation Boots. Boots. <laughs> Who's Boots? Remember I told you about little Arcus? Mm -hmm. The child that everybody follows? He grew up and he became a big constellation. And he's got a sickle in his hand, and he's got a spear in the other hand, and he goes around and conquers. And this little child came to be Boots, the dominant one of the universe. So the child grew up to be one that destroys that which is evil. It's wonderful stories. So we are setting a foundation for a cosmic sign. Pretty soon we're going to get into studying about the horse, but right now, a cosmic sign, a sign that takes place at the horse. The earth looks to the sky for a sign. Here. You got all this down? <laughs> the earth looks to the sky for a sign. Let me show you the Greek word for earth. I'm going to have to look at this. It's like this, you know. <laughs> that means the earth. It also means, in Greek, the lower mind. Let me give you another one. This is... I don't know how to make this, but, you know, it's something like that. And, and, okay? That means Jesus, the higher mind. The sun, the numerical, in Greek, as in Hebrew, every letter has a numerical value. The numerical value of this word, Jesus, and the sun, and the higher mind, is 888. The numerical value of this in Greek, which is earth in the lower mind, is 666. <laughs> See? And yet you have stupid fools hanging out in churches trying to say it's the Pope, it's Joe DiMaggio, it's uh, Marilyn Monroe, and all this crap, because they don't understand what that was. <laughs> the lower mind. 666 is the numerical value of that. 888 is the numerical value of this, which is the sun, which is Jesus, which is the higher mind. So we establish on the basis of this scripture that the Creator has provided signs for you and I to see, to look at. And next we have to see what sign we're to look at and what we should do. And as Jesus said in Luke 22:10, when you see this man with the pitcher of water, enter into the house, which means enter into yourself, and go to the upper room, and I will meet you there. So we look to the sign Aquarius, and there in Aquarius is a white horse named Pegasus. And there in the white horse is a sun star, which is a twin of the sun in our sky. It is the second coming of the Son. And no matter what anybody says, if, if I am remotely correct in saying that Jesus is the sun star, what the astronomers have just located in Pegasus is the second coming of the sun star, because it's never been seen before. And if Jesus is the, sec is the first coming of the sun star, then that second coming of the sun star is the second coming of Jesus. And it's fulfilled right now as you're sitting here. You can see it with a pair of binoculars. And so we look to that. We look to Aquarius, and we look to the stars, and we'll look to the horse, and we'll see all of these things, and we'll watch them as they fulfill themselves. And as we go along, there'll be new discoveries and new things and new exciting things. I know Sean Kenevy has been sending me stuff almost every week, and it's interesting, and I have to digest all of, these stuff, all of these things. But here we have the three planets, and if you measure those planets and go draw lines as you do, they'll measure in a triangle, a pyramid. Incidentally, you know, just before I go, because there's some people that weren't here before, I don't know if you're aware of this, but many of you watch the channel, Discovery Channel and Arts and Entertainment, and they show you the pyramids. They say, why did they build the pyramids? You have pyramids in your brain, in your spine, in your liver, in your kidney, in your blood. You have pyramids throughout your body. And they have names. They're called the Pyramids of Pharaoh. They're called the Pyramids of Rapiki. And so it's no longer why they built pyramids out there. Why did they build pyramids in here? Your body is loaded with thousands of, I mean, real pyramids. And the doctors say, and the scientists say, they describe in the, in the books, they say, and the nerves will enter in the base of the pyramid and then move in a circular fashion up and come out the apex of the pyramid. And I would tell you this, that the reason they built pyramids in the desert is the same reason that they built pyramids in you. 
And do you know what? When God said, when God was sat down with whoever the designers were for all this stuff, he says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put, um, I'm going to put 12 sets of nerves in their brain. That's going to make it work. And it'll go through 12 little outlets. And that'll, so what we've got to do up here in order so that they can keep in touch with us is we've got to make a construction. Okay, so what we'll do with the path of the sun, we'll place 12 there. And so then that will give the... I'm, I'm telling you, it's the way it was done. It wasn't, it wasn't an accident. There wasn't just 12 having to pop up there. 12 were put there to coordinate with the 12 that you have in here so that you could keep in touch. That you could be a little ET and say, home when you touch. It's all done with a great purpose and a great skill and a great wisdom. But we just have to grow up and get away from taking mythology literally and begin to understand this scientifically and begin to understand the earth and the world that you live in. And then when you're ready to do it, you'll come, you'll sit in the dark and the scorpion will fall from the web and the web will split in two and down beyond that hall of a golden light you'll see this beautiful mother Pia Mater with her arms outstretched waiting to take you into her arms and hold you to her bosom and you will have truly arrived home. And that's what this is about. And we have just separated from our first booster rocket in our journey. Okay, thank you and uh